There we go. Okay. Tonight we're going to hear from Dagbar Kinney, and of course, welcome to Science for the Board. And uh, Dagmar is going to be talking about the manufacture of a tail rotor and uh, that she did when she was working for a company called Metal Innovations. And with a team of eight people, they, they brought this tail rotor back into production, which uh, had four Sikorsky aircraft. Dagmar has a degree in uh, basically mechanical engineering, uh, me mechatronics, I think she calls it. And mm -hmm. she graduated in 1985 with uh, her degree from Germany. And um, let's get started. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. So let me introduce a helicopter, a heavy lift helicopter to you. So here you have a seven blade main rotor system on this Sikorsky sky crane. So you see the main rotors and then you've got a main rotor shaft and a transmission and then it goes to the tail and then up in the tail You, you muted, Scott muted, Dagmar. You, you have to un, un, unmute yourself. Yep, I, I just found it. My, my cursor kind of disappeared again. Okay, so uh, here we are. This aircraft can, uh, as we just talked about, this aircraft uh, has a maximum uh, takeoff weight of 47,000 pounds. It can go 13,500 feet in, uh, up in the air and uh, can fly 96 knots at that, uh, at that altitude. So the reason why this is a conventional arranged helicopter, the reason why it does have a tail rotor blade is because of Newton's third law. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you turn the main rotor blades this way and you attach a fuselage to it, you would otherwise have a very dizzy pilot if you wouldn't stop the fuselage from rotating. And that's the function of the tail rotor. So basically you um, introduce that one, pushing it um, into the other direction so you're, you can have a, a forward flight and um, counteract the, these, uh, the main rotor um, action. All right, so we set out um, the, these tail rotor blades to have a fatigue life and the customer was running out of blades and the military surplus market had traveled up. So they asked us to um, certify and manufacture these blades. And so that's what we did. Let me uh, advance here, so. Okay, so just so you know what this aircraft used to do in its military history, it really was a crane. It was a workhorse, whoops, where um, it, um, there's fun images out on the internet where you can see what it all would lift from tanks to other aircraft hulks. And it even transported uh, troops. So this aircraft was supposed to be a multi-purpose, really flexible um, uh, tool where you would just strap another modified cargo container uh, underneath the fuselage and do whatever it takes for whatever they needed. So this was 1968. The first flight this aircraft took was in 1962, the first certified flight. And so we had uh, set out with a small team and we had to learn basically what this tail rotor does, how it functions and what materials were used and why and how we can achieve the same uh, results at the end of the day. So the FAA would give us a certificate saying two things. A, the design is unchanged to the previous design and B, yes, your shop is good enough. It has all the right tools and machines and people and training, etc., in order to make it. And for that, we uh, had access 
to the complete drawing set, complete drawing set uh, off Sikorsky. And because this aircraft was manufactured uh, and designed and manufactured under a military contract, so government funds were used, um, we were able to request through the Freedom of Information Act the complete drawing set. But as you can see, these drawings were PDFs of Mylar's papers, and uh, some of them were not available to us. They were kind of descriptions of templates, which were physical um, templates, like a piece of metal with a certain shape, for example, which caused us some headache uh, down the road. Okay, so we analyzed the drawing. And we did at the end get an approval. So this is uh, worth three years of work and about 2,500 engineering hours. And I wanna show you what a helicopter uh, rotor blade will go through. So this is a video of a main rotor where a lipstick, the, the military put a lipstick camera on um, the hub of a main rotor and looks alongside the leading edge of that rotor blade and you will see how it bends throughout uh, one revolution um, and another and you will see the whoops you will see if i can get my my thing started there we go so there you go so this is a hunk of metal that is going through the air and bending. So you can see the reason why fatigue life is a real issue. And you can see also the tail rotor blade uh, of this particular helicopter coming by every once in a while. So you saw that? So that uh, is pretty um, amazing. So fatigue life is real. So here's our little team. So there's only four of the metal innovations people. So here's one of our designers, that's me. Then here's our quality inspector, the chief inspector for the repair station. Here's Dr. Laird, that Bruce knows, crazy, crazy FEA specialist. And uh, here is Ray Prouty. So Ray Prouty, um, is or was he is now he died a couple of years ago but he wrote the book on aerodynamics and stabilities for helicopter he was the one that was actually there empirically doing empirical science for uh, figuring a lot of these things out so he developed the math and for us he calculated um, all the loads that we needed in order to really understand what the material and what we needed to do. So here we are holding a uh, rotor blade so you can get an um, idea of the dimension. So it's seven foot long and uh, there's m another piece that goes to the end. So this is what we call a spar. The close view of the arrangement. So here comes the gears come up and it drives the rotor and you have a, a directly opposed a four piece arrangement. And this uh, spider one is the pitchfork here where you cyclically rotate these blades. So you change the pitch angle uh, in each revolution. And the tail rotor goes much faster than the main rotor. I, I can't quite remember, but I think the main rotor was 105 RPM and the tail rotor is 840. So at the tip, and that is designed, so at the tip speed, you're about 0.85, uh, Mach 0.85, uh, because when you hit um, the, the sound barrier, then you invite all sorts of interesting issues. And uh, I want to show you what a wing looks like. So in, you know, an airplane in, uh, with the FAA is called a fixed wing. So here's a wing shape. So you see a leading edge and the trailing edge. So you got a knobbly front and a, a thin aft section. And 
the center is called the cord. So what is um, significant here is, and here's the rotating point, what I showed you earlier in the other slide, where you change the pitch angle off the blade. So you, you angle it up. And that has an effect when you drive it. So uh, again, from you have a fixed wing aircraft and with a fixed wing aircraft, you need to run um, on, a, on a runway. <laughs> Actually, I'm just realizing runway. So you run, run up in order to get enough lift produced in order to take off. And in a rotary uh, aircraft, so it's a rotary wing in technical lingo with the FAA, that's just that. You take a wing and you rotate it around and around and create your lift so you get this unique ability for vertical takeoff and vertical landings and, be, uh, and the position that goes along with it. What is significant here is your angle of attack that uh, will cause the airfoil to produce the lift. And um, for a lack of time, so when you change the pitch, you typically change the angle of attack. There's, it's more complicated, but uh, let's assume that um, is about the same. So, and then uh, you have a resultant lift vector that comes out of it, but you also have a drag. So the more you pitch it, the more you have drag and the resultant of those, uh, the vector product is uh, the resultant lift that you get out of this wing and this rotary wing. Okay, so remember the four blade arrangements? So here is, if I can find, on the very left is the center of the hub. And I can't find, uh, there we go. So this is the center of the hub, and then this is the tip. And here is where your rotor blade is attached. And from here to here is uh, eight feet. And then in order for uh, Ray Prouty to calculate what lift and drag looks like in, uh, across this blade, you just divide it in segments. So you have 20 segments and they call it uh, blade element theory. And then each segment, so this would be considered blade station 20, blade station 19, 18, and so forth. So just remember that. And uh, then uh, I made a little uh, explanation. So picture yourself standing on the side of the aircraft looking directly at the tail rotor. Your nose would be to the left and the uh, aircraft would be running and the tail rotor would be, system would be rotating um, clockwise. So here again is your, the center of your hub. Here's the rotor blade and it points up right now. So here's the, uh, the pointy tip and here's the blunt tip. And then you have these 20 stations. And then uh, we will start uh, showing the lift and the drag starting here from azimuth zero uh, all the way 360 degrees around. So, and then Ray calculated for us what at the maximum gross weight and the maximum uh, elevation possible and the maximum speed, which we all anticipated that would be the, the worst case scenario for this blade. Um, what the what it looks like. So you can see here at azimuth zero, um, just for reference again. So here's the center of the hub, which is this point zero. And then here goes to blade station five, which is eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. So that's about uh, where, where blade station five is. And then um, you see here lift is blue and drag is red. So, and then here's blade station 20, 15, 10, et cetera. So let's look at this. So you can see that the lift is the greatest on about uh, station 20, uh, 19 in the azimuth zero and flight forward is to the left again. So the aircraft would be moving to the left. So then um, in that position, your lift gets diminished even gets negative 
more negative, oh, comes up in the center of the blade, goes up, goes up, and even more, even more, even more, oh, now it goes back down, and at zero, it goes back up. So that is consistent with what we saw in the video, where you're, you could see that the lift causes the blade um, to actually bend in up and downwards. So it was kind of flapping in um, with the loads that it was experiencing. Now, when Ray did the calculation, he found that the maximum weight and elevation and speed wasn't the worst case scenario. It was actually when you're in a hover and you have a turn of greater than 25 degrees per second turning rate and you step on the left pedal to stop this right turn. That's the worst case scenario. So here is what this scenario, so he had to calculate all sorts of flight uh, scenarios and we found that um, at 12 degrees pitch angle, you had over 200 pounds of lift at uh, blade station 19. And when you compare that, it's almost double of what at 47,000 pounds at 13,500 feet and 96 knots is. So the tail rotor eats quite a bit of power from the engines and from the whole system in order to maintain the aircraft in its, uh, well, desired position. All right, so now we knew that. So here you have, we got two rotor blades from the customer and here you can see the size of the aircraft. So here's two people. Here's two people on a stand taking the rotor blades off and uh, it takes a boom truck to, the, do it easily. And we decided we're gonna take those two blades apart. So here's one blade in the back. You see it still in, 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 um, in one piece. And uh, so here's the backbone, which we call the spar. And then here's the cuff, which is kind of a glorified old fashioned clothespin that slides over here. You can see it here and then gets bolted uh, together. There's shims. Uh, that prevent uh, dissimilar metal uh, issues. And then you have this pocket that I was talking about earlier where all these ribs are being installed inside the skin with a guardrail. And then you have a tip cap, tip cap bracket, and then uh, weights. So you have to balance this whole thing statically as well as dynamically. And then there's a little piece at the end, uh, which is a fairing. Um, it's the same construct than this, but uh, it had some aerodynamic uh, significance. So, and lo and behold, everything in this assembly gets glued together. So you have what they call metal bonded, uh, a bit metal bonded structure. So you have adhesive here, here on all the top surfaces. And remember these, these ribs are very thin. So a pocket is less than two pounds, the complete assembly, it's six foot long. This one, um, the spar, I can't remember. I think the, I could lift up a whole tail rotor blade, no problems. I think it's 30 pounds total or so. And everything needs to be glued together. So this one gets glued inside here, then this one gets glued on there, and then this one gets glued onto the spar. And these adhesive systems are old fashioned and old AF6. So the blades that we cut apart, they were still holding. We had to actually destroy the pocket in order to get to the, um, to the spar on the one. Then we decided to take the other one and cut it apart and analyze the airfoil. So you can see this hollow D-shaped aluminum spar shape and it gets bigger and bigger. And you can see here on the table, so here's the tip end and then it gets bigger. So this is a seamless extruded aluminum 6061 piece. And uh, we found that Sikorsky built these but they didn't comply to the Sikorsky drawing. So we had to 
figure something out on how to make it fit the approved design drawings. And for that one, uh, Ray Prouty really helped us analyzing what the significance of the aerodynamics are. So if we stick to the original profile versus what Sikorsky did and what we wanted to do and how we achieve all this, it, it uh, was quite the challenge. So the spar is 6061, uh, a hollow extrusion. It's machined to size, then twisted. And uh, then everything at the end is glued together except for the cuff where it is being um, a, both a joint in this assembly. So um, in the 1930s, the US government um, had NACA, which is the precursor to NASA. And they, what they did is they uh, had a government sponsored wind tunnel testing. So they tested all sorts of different shapes and um, then made it available to the public. And basically then the Sikorsky's and the Boeing's and the Hughes aircraft companies would then come and say, hey, we will pick um, this profile for the front end of the blade, then this profile for the rest of the blade. And uh, because there were wind tunnel um, results there, they were tested, they didn't have to do the testing. So which saved a lot of money and sped up the process of design for these private entities. And then they developed, a formula was developed for um, figuring out the, um, the profile of these blades. So you can see here, again, the cord line is important. Uh, this is an asymmetrical uh, shape. And however, back then, you could not really manufacture asymmetrical blades. Uh, nowadays, with composite materials and other manufacturing technologies, it's, you can do it. But way back when, you were bound to have a symmetrical airfoil. So here again, here's the cord of the airfoil. And then from zero to here, this is the same distance as from zero to here. And uh, NACA 12, the, they have a, a system where the zero, zero means it's symmetrical and 12 means um, the, the cord line is, the, is about here. That, that's 12%. So here's the, the cord line. So the cord line and 12% of it is about here. Well, wherever the top is. So that's the biggest one. All right. And then we developed, because uh, the extrusion press, um, when it uh, pushes the extrusion out, originally when it starts, it pushes out hundreds of feet. It will be cold and after hundreds of feet, it will be hot. So you have an expansion in the built in into the manufacturing process. So uh, what this achieves is it only um, measures the thickness at various stations. So you have a wall thickness here, a wall thickness here, a wall thickness here, etc. And one has to loft from a machining or from a, from a manufacturing point of view, you have to loft it so you have a smooth surface, not creating any microgeometry that could give you a fatigue life problem. So very critical uh, and very challenging, especially when you then have to twist the spar. Uh, so we'll get to that one. So we modeled it in SOLIDWORKS and we were, um, stuck with being unable to twist in the virtual world and assemble it. So we had to talk the FAA into saying, okay, we we're having a straight spar, but in the manufacturing drawing, we have the processes in place to twist it because that makes a difference in aerodynamics, but I won't go into that right now. Then we uh, had a, we got a little software showing what the lofting has to be. So here, the green line shows you what the, what the, um, 
we had one drawing where we didn't have the actual part. So Sikorsky literally had a tool that had this shape. And all we had was a coordinate system how to make this tool. And uh, Ray was telling us, so he, there's some old timers when this project was done, some old timers told us Sikorsky actually hired blind people to do this sanding. So they would sit day in, day out and sand with this template. And they found that blind people were the most sensitive and most reliable to get this production step done. Yes, and then we twisted this bar. So what you have to do is you machine it straight and then you fill it with sand and then you put it in the fixture and then you twist it and you have to over twist it because each material has a spring back behavior and it took us some empirical testing to get it just right and it has to be twisted in various places at the right degrees. So again, this lofting comes in really important. Then we had to figure out how to machine it. So you have a seven foot piece. We had a foam piece. We had a design fixturing on this CNC machine. We had to create the program and we had to make sure that this could be done in a robotic uh, style. Remember where the blind people were sanding it? So at Sikorsky, they did a little rough cutout and then the rest was all done by hand. And I set out, I said, no, I want to have sanding minimized to half a day, which I did not achieve. Um, we ended up uh, between eight to 12 hours on hand sanding after it's done. But when you machine something like this, we had to get to a point where in the evening we would set it up and in the morning we would put all the chips away and find it under where the robot was uh, doing one side, flip it over to the other side. And so that was kind of important and it's not simplistic because over that length, you create tension, surface tensions in the machining process. So it took a lot of doing to get that done. And then of course we had to inspect and go to the manufacturer to get these um, extrusions. So you see the zigzag building in the back and uh, inside we were not allowed to take photos on the inside other than what Justin down here is sitting inspecting the part. So this press is inside this building. It's two and a half stories tall. It uh, was designed and uh, created and built by, the, uh, by Germans and then um, during World War II, and it is the only machine on the Western Hemisphere that can do a seamless extrusion. It's a very complicated process. And so when uh, the Allied forces came and Germany had to capitulate, uh, they basically took the machine apart, threw it in the river of Rhine, and uh, abandoned it. And then uh, the Americans pulled it out of the river, put it on the barge, sent it to New Jersey. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, they, they installed a flooring. And then when the machine arrived, they put it on the flooring and built a building around it. And the way this technology works is you have a, what they call a standard, Sikorsky Engineering, I forgot what the R stands for. So in this metal cabinet, since 1960, this piece has been stored at Alcoa in New Jersey and showing how many bubbles and imperfections you can have on the inside. So here sits Justin's with a boroscope and he inspects every one of these spars. And here's main rotor spars, here's the little guys, here's the little brothers and sisters uh, for the tail rotor spars. And I kid you not, every single helicopter in the United States has been getting its conventional aluminum seamless extruded spar from this machine. And, and that was quite the story, I thought. Okay, so now we had our parts and pieces. And then we, went, we were still struggling with some 
SOLIDWORKS issue. So you can see at the tip end, for example, you have a part that holds the tip cap on that has joggles every which way and a compound surface. So see, this curvature is a compound, so it gets smaller. Then here's a joggle, and then here's a joggle. And it's very thick. So in order for us to bring this into the modern world and make the computer uh, flatten it so it's accurate and we can laser cut it or, or uh, water jet it, that was quite the feat. That was very difficult. We, we finally got it. Same is true for the tip cap. It was really difficult. This is a very thin piece of material and we had to find a way of um, making it and it literally was had to be designed like a boat. So you had to slice it into section. You had to make sure it still complies so it fits over the end of the blade. And uh, it was amazingly complicated. The ribs also caused us some issues. So here's a finished ribs, but they have these little holes and dimples installed for uh, stiffness and Boy, they were difficult. We had to actually install that in the in the flat pattern and talk the FAA into um, working, finding a workaround. So we were allowed to use a computer modeled piece in order to bend it up then later and um, have out of sequence process step compared to what we achieved in the drawing. So uh, yes, and then we found when we looked at um, the installation, we took the one blade apart, that um, Sikorsky did some inventive manufacturing techniques. So here's the trailing edge, uh, as we talked about. And in the trailing edge, there's a little um, triangular piece that's pushed in all the way along. The trailing edge has to have some stiffness, but it has to be also very smooth. So in order for a rib that didn't fit to fit, they just sliced it and squished it in there and glued it together and never told anybody. So the drawing was off and we had to fix that and we did. So here's a, here's a stiffening piece in the trailing edge. So the skin, as you can see, is very thin. So it's 20 thou and it gets folded and uh, glued in place. And then there's a little uh, piece. And we had to actually go and derive this shape from three little blocks that Sikorsky had put into the whole assembly, which uh, was um, a lofting um, adventure. So, <laughs> I'm just reliving the pain of some of this. <laughs> and here's my last slide. So in order to remember the titanium cuff, that uh, close pin that goes above it, here's a little um, lookout from a red hot uh, forged one. So this is a forged part. So uh, this was done at McMilliams Forge in New Jersey as well. And this was done on a brand new machine that they had just installed, the same principle. They built the concrete floor and put the machine in and then built the building around it. And this has a 30 foot flywheel over the cross in order to get the force to have a cylinder come down. It's like a bayonet, it's a quarter turn cylinder and you have a die in here, um, two, two part die and the billet gets heated in this induction oven. Ooh. Oops, my, my screen just went kaput. Hang on for a second. I need to go to the back. I don't know why. And uh, okay, so here we go. So uh, it gets taken out of this uh, oven by the crane operator zips it over into the die. Then another operator stands at the controls and will make this cylinder come down. And then the operator here will take a thong and flip it over and it comes down again. And there's four different dies and this is what the shape looks like. It's a very 
um, interesting process because your flow lines have to go up in order to get the fatigue resistance to do the purpose of um, what that uh, helicopter does. All right, and that was very interesting to do that um, quality audit on them and see how the part actually gets manufactured. So we had to learn all aspects. And that concludes how to reverse engineer a tail rotor blade that has not been manufactured for over 20 years. If you have any questions, I probably have more answers and, and uh, you have to stop me because this is kind of exciting and I love doing it. Wow, what a story. <laughs> can I ask Tell me you, about the hand sanding. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, do I, um, hang on for a second. Uh, Bruce, do I just stop the video or how do I go about this? Oh, that's okay, just leave it there. Um, okay. Neil, Neil asked you to, um, asked, asked, asked to have you explain how you do this, the hand sanding. I was fascinated by a little more about that. Uh, so what we had to do, so we took um, a, so we had basically the CNC process got us um, to the, the baseline. And then we developed an ultrasonic um, methodology in order to measure the wall thickness. And then we had um, the stations laid out. So you would put it in a fixture and then you would know here's your station this and here's your station this and here's your numbers. So you had the drawing right underneath and then you would have to loft it. So you would the sa put the sander down and the, the, um, the critical part was you cannot just sand, you have to stop and and uh, because temperature changes will make the part expand. So this was really super critical. Um, you would have to then uh, put it in cold water. So we had a big cow trough there. So you put it back in water, cool it down to an agreeable temperature, and then ultrasonic measure the thickness of the area, and then go to the next one. We had one mechanic who was not good at it. So we ended up with a wavy spar that had to be reworked um, uh, quite a bit because he didn't grasp the concept that you have to carefully loft it from one dimension to the next. But the, the blind people, why were the blind people better at this? Uh, because what they did is they had the, the, the template and then they would take their hands and then they would feel where the, where the template was touching and where they had uneven areas. So they would manually go with the template and feel alongside it. And literally, um, we, we talked with one gentleman uh, from Ericsson and he said they were there 10 hours a day round. The, so they had three shifts. Um, and especially during um, wartime season, uh, they, they would continuously um, sand. And again, they hand sanded it because what we found, and, and I understand why that is, when you do a, a machine, it gets too hot and then your dimension is off. So it's, it's super sensitive. Yeah. Hmm. This is a wonderful talk about the detail and the complexity of making anything. It's it's wonderful, Kimmy. Thank you. You're I'm welcome. Curious, I am I am curious about the adhesive. What kind of adhesive did they use, and what kind of adhesive did you use? So we used all of the original adhesive. So 3M manufactured this AF6 and uh, all the other ones, and they are film adhesives. So it takes, so for example, this pocket, um, I was telling you the, the spar was twisted, right? So we had to build a fixture, and uh, so it takes several elements. It takes heat, time, 
and a pressure. So we had to build a fixture for this pocket and the, the pressure was, I can't remember what exactly the numbers were, but it was significant. <coughs> so you had to, we had to design a fixture that glued the ribs into the skin at the twisted state and providing that the airflow and the ramp rate is homogenous throughout the whole assembly. So there's, there was 46 ribs in that assembly and you had to, we actually had to find uh, or direct hot air to various spots. And then we had to crank the pressure up on each rib station. It was a very complicated uh, fixture to be built and everything is critical, but we exchanged one for a newer, more modern foam adhesive to put the pocket on the back of the spar because what we found when we took the other ones apart that the whole pocket was only attached on the two little outside um, joggles. So I was uncomfortable with that and so we took a foam adhesive where then the, the flat spot on the spar would foam up and remember the holes in, in that uh, um, uh, yes. one long strip? So it would bulge around the holes and give it extra stability. So we were much more comfortable that the pockets wouldn't take off. Mm. Thank you. I have a question for you, Dagmar. Okay. I noticed in the, the you were talking about 200 pounds, right? Was yes. the, the, the peak force. The lift. Mm -hmm. So that was the force on one little part of a, of, a, of, a, of a blade, right? Yes. And then what was the, so then there were enough, if, if I added up all those forces together, I'd get 47,000 pounds or, or is that no, right? Um, the main rotor, remember that you have seven blades on the main rotor, so they provide the lift uh, oh, yeah, for, yeah. for those. The tail yeah. rotor only prevents it from spinning the opposite yeah. direction. So, it, all, so it, all, it only needs, uh, you know, like a thousand pounds or something like that altogether? Yes, yes. And yeah. um, the interesting part on that one is too that, um, as I said, power consumption. So a lot of the horsepower needed actually goes to the tail rotor. So that's why there are other design choices like the Boeing with the tandem rotors where you have a rotor spinning one direction and the other rotor spinning the other direction. Hmm. Versus having a conventional tail rotor and then plus you need a tail boom in order to get it away from the main rotor so you're not colliding with anything. I'm just, I, you make me not want to fly in a helicopter. It makes me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking of all the things that could possibly go wrong and they're glued together my god and it bends it, like that it's incredible it is incredible i mean the technology and the and if you think about this is from the from the 50s so the development and the design started um in the 50s and uh I mean, I worked for Columbia Helicopters for five years, and there the oldest drawing we had from was from 1958. And in this project, the oldest drawing from Sikorsky I had was 1959. Hmm. My father would say, helicopters are all right, but I hope that nut doesn't come off. <laughs> But I tell you, helicopters with the vertical takeoff, I mean, they, they're so unique. Um, there's no other tool that can do what they do. It, it's just as simple as that. I mean, think about uh, where they all operate. They operate in medical, um, being picked up from a life flight helicopter. I have a presentation where I can show um, what they do uh, firefighting on how they fly uh, on fires and how they disperse. It's, it, I mean, that would be, if you have anything but a helicopter, like the big tankers, they have, a, they have to have a runway. If you have a 747 here from McMinnville, 
um, flying a fire and, and dispensing water. They need somewhere where they can land that aircraft. Yeah. And uh, a helicopter is much more versatile. That's why they were so important in Asian jungle, Asian yeah. jungle wars. Yeah. In Vietnam. yeah. If that, if the tail rotor fails, the helicopter is pretty well lost, I suppose. It would just spin out of control. Yeah. Yes. So as a pilot, I can tell you that's um, one of the emergency maneuvers. What you do is, in order to land safely, you keep up your speed. So you slipstream the fuselage. So there's a design uh, requirement that you can still land when, you're, when you lose your tail rotor. You can still land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's called a run on landing, literally a running landing. So you... Uh, if you're on skids, you're sparking along on a tarmac. I've done that one. Yeah. Dykar, I'm curious about the need for the spar to be twisted. Uh, is that because the velocity is very different, at, so much higher at the end of the rotor? I, I have to look that up. I was wondering myself, I've forgotten about it, but it has to do with the center of pressure being in all in one spot to be equally distributed, uh, if I recall correctly, but I can't quite explain it. So I would have to look that up and email Bruce on why that is. Um, but um, yeah, I used to know that, but it's been a long time. So this project was 12 years ago and I've moved on and done other things. And so this was a fun exercise to go back in, in my memory banks. Thank yeah, you. I think, uh, I think uh, airplane propellers are the same way, aren't they? Aren't they twisted? Yes, yes they're always twisted. Mm -hmm. Correct. Did, did I understand right that, that the, uh, you, you change the pitch of the blade as, as it's rotating, that they're not all set at, at this? You don't just move all of the pitches together? Um, the, the rotor system, that's a lecture all by itself, but the rotor system is uh, free in certain dimensions. So the main rotor um, is um, the blades can go up so they can flap um, and they're basically free to move. So changing pitch isn't all the story. So on the tail rotor, it's more fixed. It's a cyclical pitch change because you're there along for the ride and um, you have issues when you add forward speed to a rotor system, you're adding the velocity to it yeah. and eventually you're, you're losing your lift. So you're stalling the blade. That's um, um, that's a critical problem there. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I, I had, it did. Thanks. I had one other question. How did how similar would the original manufacturing process have been? Was this did you really duplicate that essentially, or? Is it much harder because it's reverse engineered? Uh, we did what we could. So if companies were still around, like McWilliams Forge, they had the dies from way back when. But uh, we brought it into the uh, next century. So this press, the, the original ones done, were done by hand. So there was a die and uh, you had manual operator where somebody had literally a torch and a foot pedal and a water hose and you would heat it up and somebody would evaluate okay it's the right color and i'm gonna bang down it's like a double pylon weight on onto this thing and um, and so Alcoa was one of them, uh, then McWilliams Forge was one of them where we used them and they still had all the paperwork and all the uh, parts there. They just had forgotten how to do it. So we had to restart with them. And then uh, Rubbercraft was another one, which um, I was talking about these um, weights that get pushed in. They have a vulcanized um, 
rubber onto a piece of metal that um, holds these balance weights inside the blades for static balancing. So it's, it was a mix, it was a mix. Um, we, we, did, we did certify with a virtual blade, but we ended up having to do a same drawing packet. So we weren't able to fully bring it into, um, uh, well, what would you call that, into a different state of manufacturing. So we, we still had to rely on, uh, on some of the old processes. I, uh, we had, I don't know, 50 or 60 process specifications, you know, machining, um, forging. The forging spec alone was 50 pages long and was so convoluted, I had to rewrite the whole dang thing. So, Kenny, since the titanium tip was such a big deal, why titanium? Why not just make it out of aluminum? It's not like it's, it's uh, you know, beating on anything except air, right? Um, it was uh, strength and flexibility. So, the, the cuff sits... Um, titanium is a lot more forgiving when it comes to... Um, to it has a bigger memory when it comes to uh, vibratory profiles. So, for example, we uh, our CNC machine right had uh, twenty horsepowers on a five-axis head. So, when we would drill down, we would have to use the full twenty horsepowers and the top speed of the machine in order to uh, create a um, thread to cut a thread via CNC because if you're not fast enough at the turning point at the bottom the material will clamp up and then it'll break the tool. Mm. Wow. So it's much more forgiving so they that's that's um, a good material choice. Hey Dagmar. Yeah. I think I'm I want to um make a, uh, an announcement. Okay. Um, so Peter Scott, he spoke to our group on the topic of artificial intelligence. And he asked me to let you know that he's continuing his um, studies course, AI and You, that covers topics he spoke about and more. And he'll be offering a course online starting on September 9th, running for five two hour weekly sessions. And, um, it's run in from the University of Victoria. And I think Peter is on line. Are you here, Peter? Uh, yep, I was talking to ask Dag our question too, um, but yes. Yeah, if, if maybe you could um, to just, just complete the uh, introduction of your course and then, then ask your question. Sure, it's pretty much gonna be covering the same kind of things that we were talking about only in more of detail, obviously and uh, exploring the uh, economic and sociological and financial uh, impacts of artificial intelligence current and projected and, and possible and getting into um, what artificial intelligence is, isn't, can and can't do, uh, but no computer experience required and um, and there'll be time for diversions into things like uh, people, uh, biographies or uh, uh, profiles of people in the field, uh, AI in media and fiction, things like that. Will it be a Zoom meeting? Yes, it'll be on Zoom. That's how they're, they're doing it. Okay. And you can ask your question. Yeah. Oh, if, if maybe you could email that to uh, oh, I will. Anyone in the group that didn't didn't um, make it because and 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 uh, and the people who are here too because there's a link in there for registering. Um, Dagmar, you that was great talk. You mentioned um, interesting effects if the blade approached the speed of sound. What are those? So in uh, every helicopter is designed that at the tip 
you're, you're close to the speed of sound, but not um, too close because otherwise you will experience buffeting, which will give you a lot more uh, fatigue problems than you ever wanted to have. Has anyone ever made a helicopter where the blade did go above the speed of sound and did they no. regret it or what? No, well, they, they tried to push it um, and uh, it, it just, it will not work. It, it will be so violent um, that uh, you destroy the aircraft. Thanks. The fluid dynamics in the... I, I, I heard and understood that, that chop, chop, chop you hear from a helicopter was actually sonic booms. That's not correct? I, I did not catch that. I'm sorry, Dagmar, this is John Miller. Hey, I heard the, that chop, chop, chop sound we hear on the ground from a helicopter was actually sonic booms. Uh, yes. from the rotors. That's not correct? Sure. There are certain, well, yes and no. So there are certain flight maneuvers where, so you're, you're, uh, let me, um, let me show you something here. So um, the air gets pumped through the uh, system of the rotors, right? So it's like a big air donut. If you would be color coding the air, being pumped through a rotor system, it would be looking like a donut. So, and if you're, for example, and so you're, you're having areas where you're compressing air, and if one, uh, the next blade hits that compressed air at the right moment, you're creating a sound. Um, but it's a misnomer saying that's the speed of sound per se. So it's not that the blade goes speed of sound, but uh, you're, you're um, in, encountering a denser piece of air with a piece of metal and uh, another air pocket. So it's really a, like a, a clap. The clock wave that you would but get. Yes, in principle, in the minutia detail, that would be exceeding uh, speed of sound. I had a question, Dagmar. This is just absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Uh, if I look at, at a, a jet engine, the rotor in there has got a velocity over the speed of sound? In, um, in a jet engine. A high bypass. Well, yeah, uh, there, well, you don't have any moving parts where it actually happens. So you have a compressor with the turbine blades in there. Yes. And so you're compressing the air to a point where it accelerates and then you uh, have the burning chamber and then you get the, your thrust uh, from a different action where there is no mechanical piece involved. But somewhere the the rotational velocity of the compressor blade, is that subsonic or supersonic? Um, I thought it was supersonic. You know, I would have to, um, because in the engines for the 107, that's, that thing rotates at 30,000 RPM uh, in the compressor section. And uh, I don't know, I, it's a good question. I would have to study that. Well, t turbofan tips, uh, blade tips do exceed the speed of sound. Uh huh. But that's, you know, the prop tips uh, sh should not. According yeah, to the Bruce, internet, right here. Bruce, Bruce, <laughs> why, why don't we see, uh, why don't we hear small sonic booms if that's the case? That, that's not sonic booms. That's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's just, a, it's like, it's like a wave slap. It's yes. a, it's a wop wop. It's, it's not actually. Um, exceeding the speed of sound. And piloting techniques will, um, will um, reduce the amount of that noise. Yeah, I just read, I just read it while, while, you were, while you were talking and there was, it says, it says very specifically that helicopter blades do not exceed the speed of sound. That's, that people think that that is a, uh, but it's a misnomer. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. It is.
Yep. So now you know everything about helicopters. <laughs> I think it'd be fun okay. someday so, to, to one, actually one, one, go one through it. And so, Bagmar, so what causes that chop, chop, chop we hear from helicopters if it's not sonic, mini sonic booms? So, what the question is, what causes the chop, chop, chop if it's not a sonic boom? Yes. Um, how, how can I explain this? Um, I believe that's cavitation. That could that could be yes because you're in cavitation you also have a, uh, a a differential in pressure from one to the other and then you're popping it right that's a that's a good stumper john i would have to research that so do uh, <laughs> helicopter rotors routinely create cavitation <laughs> Um, in certain situations, uh, you do. So, for example, if you have a tailwind, so remember I talked about the donut. If you have a tailwind and you're landing, so you're coming down and you're, you're flying through that donut, your blades will automatically hit this denser donut air and will continuously uh, make a loud flapping sound. So what you have to do as a pilot is you're slowing down in order to avoid um, flying into the what they call unclean air. So, um, or you're going faster, hmm. and, but it's just a... Uh, are, there, uh, are there any anti-cavitation measures be to reduce energy loss? No, uh, it's it's really piloting techniques, uh, but you will uh, be chewed out by the mechanic because with that you're taking the paint off the blades much faster than uh, if you're flying differently. I, I agree with Peter. That, that's kind of odd, Dagmar, because uh, submarines have done uh, total... Uh, uh, how do I say, uh, shape studies to reduce cavitation. And I would think uh, that would be true of helicopter rotors too. Yeah, I don't know the answer. I would have to research that. I, I can't. So, so here, here's what the internet says. It says blade vortex interaction noise happens when approaching blades hit the vortices of retreating blades. Mm -hmm. When a helicopter is making an approach, the main rotor blades can move into the path of a vortex produced by the blades ahead producing a sound called blade slap. Mm -hmm. Let's cut the guess on the preceding question that, that the, the uh, submarine blades are of course operating in water, which is incompressible and air is compressible. So I would imagine that, although I know, know nothing really about this, that the, the actual uh, pressure situation is, is very different. Good point. Can I ask a, another question? I mean, is this, it, it seems like you've explained, I mean, I always sort of wondered about this. You look at old Dutch windmills, essentially the whole windmill is blade. You mm -hmm. look at uh, these uh, uh, wind turbines for generating electricity mm -hmm. and they usually just two or three blades. I mean, is it just to avoid this, this problem of, of uh, hitting a vortex from a, another blade as the whole system is rotating? Hmm. I, I would imagine yeah. you want to capture all the energy you can. Yeah, you do. I don't know why windmills um, or the modern windmills are three-bladed more or less versus five-bladed. Um, Yeah. These are fascinating questions. It tells they us are. That you they are. They are good stumpers. Yeah. Well, you, the interesting thing about when you read them, they they say it is believed. So I think some of these things they are they still aren't sure after all these years. So. Well, I can tell yeah. you. For example, you know when Boeing certifies large aircraft, they are allowed by the FAA to use uh, some certified models. So if you can show that your modeling, uh, like uh, 
matches within a certain percentage of the reality as tested, then you can make predictions based on a model and you don't have to do testing. In helicopters, that's not true. Um, there has not been a successful modeling of a rotor system in, in flight in the dynamic situation. So um, one thing that happened uh, in the beginning when they designed the first helicopter Helicopters, you would be able to hover, but then you see on the internet there's some video out there. The moment they would go into forward flight, they'd flip over, and mm. and uh, the the solution to that one was let the blades go flat free to a certain degree, and then it will equalize all by itself. So it there are so many dimensions and degrees of freedom that. Um, it hasn't it hasn't happened and that's from certification point of view from the FAA in helicopters you test you you have to show by test yeah uh, there's not a not a good you know it's, uh, individual parts and pieces of course you can model and you can certify that way but a whole helicopter nope you got to go test it's much more expensive than what a Boeing I mean Boeing has to um, load the wings and, and uh, do some of those testings, but there's a lot that they can now really certify without having to uh, break five aircraft.